Welcome back to our series, Standing Strong in a Wicked World. It is a study of the book of Daniel. We're well into the second half of the book of Daniel. And that's a big deal because the first half is very different than the ha second half. The first six chapters are filled with the wonderful stories that we know and love from Daniel, the fiery furnace, the handwriting on the wall, the lion's den, and Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. But the second half of J Daniel, and that's chapters 7 through 12, are all apocalyptic visions, visions about things to come in the end times. And so we want to make sure that we know that as we read these things, that these are visions that were given to Daniel, and much of it was revealed through the angel Gabriel, as we're about to see. Um, but also it has to do with the future kingdoms of his time, but also the future kingdoms of our time as well. But last week, if you remember, uh, it was chapter 8, and Daniel had had a vision about the rise and fall of future kingdoms, and how he felt afterwards, he felt appalled and perplexed. Let me just read the last part of Daniel 8 before we jump into chapter 9. Daniel 8, 26 through 27. The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision, but it was beyond understanding. All right, so he was perplexed. He's appalled. He didn't fully understand it. Us, however, from a modern perspective, we could look back. What happened in the life of Daniel and what happened in the years that followed? And it, as it, it was laid out in these visions, it did come true. Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persian Medo Empire. They were conquered by the Greeks, and eventually they were conquered by the Romans, and it just listed those kingdoms in succession. <clears throat> now, Daniel is about to receive prophecies about the end of time. Not the end of his time, but the end of the age. And it's interesting here, because as he's seeing these the succession of kingdoms, just think about it. Babylon took over everything, right? And then Medo-Persia took over Babylon. And then Greece took over Medo-Persia. And Rome took over Greece. But then we don't see another 2,000 years worth of kingdoms rising and falling, at least in prophecies. There's a period that it seems as though is not prophesied about. And this is a grace period that we call the age of grace or the church age, or as Jesus put it, the time of the Gentiles. And, and it's the age after the Roman Empire, during the time which, in which Jesus died, rose from the dead, the church was established and spread, until the time of the end. We're in that time right now. And, and Paul said in Romans eleven twenty five, 25, he said, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the number of Gentiles has come in. And Jesus said, Jerusalem will be trampled on by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that was in Luke 21, 24. So these are important things because we're in this period of time where we don't see Daniel's kingdoms rising and falling. We see the door open for Gentiles or unbelievers to come in and, and find Messiah. All right, so now we're in this like waiting period. But bear in mind, the end can happen at any time. And I'll explain that in just a second. So let's jump into Daniel chapter 9. Uh, he's going to tell about a visit from Gabriel after he was praying and repenting. It's written during the time of Darius. So again, he's looking back. It's not during the current time he's writing. He's looking back at things that he experienced during these times. Uh, and Darius was known for the lion's den. He's the lion's den king. Not the lion king, that's somebody else. All right, let's get into chapter 9 of Daniel, starting with verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood the scriptures according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet that the desolation of Jerusalem would last 70 years. So I turned to the Lord and pleaded with him in prayer and petition in fasting in sackcloth and ashes. All right, so Daniel's just remembering and recounting that the scriptures that were put forth previously in Jeremiah, this is a prophecy, Jeremiah 25, that the captivity of Babylon would last seven years. Um, but he's about to go into prayer, and a, and a special kind of prayer, a contrite prayer of repentance. The sackcloth and ashes, the fasting, the petition. He is humbling himself before God and going into prayer because he's, he has seen through these kingdoms rising and falling how harshly the Lord deals with pride and arrogance and how favorably he deals with humility and contrition. And he wants to be on the humility and contrition side even 
as it was already prophesied how long they'll be there, but these remaining years, he wanted to make sure, not take any chances, make sure that God knew that the, the sin that had got his people there is being repented of and, and contrite and confessed. So here's the prayer. It starts in verse four. I pray to the Lord my God and confess, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your prophets or your servants who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Verse seven, Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, both near and far, and all the countries where you have scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. We and our kings, our princes, our ancestors are covered with shame, Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through the servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the words spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing on us great disaster. Under the whole heaven, there's never been done like what has happened to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our sin and giving attention to the truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring disaster on us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. All right, so Daniel's laying it out. He's just telling it like it is, um, not pulling any punches and letting God know that he recognizes why they are in this disastrous predicament. And he grew up in a Jew, as a Jew in Jerusalem. I'm not sure if Daniel was a good Jew or a bad Jew. It, it very might well be that Daniel was part of the sin that got God so angry in Jerusalem. However, if that's the case, Daniel's heart changed during the time of captivity. But he was there, Daniel, growing up in Jerusalem during the first temple, and he was certainly familiar with the law of the words the words of Moses and the prophets, the law and the prophets, Moses. And in this case, he's just quoting Jeremiah. And just so you know, God made it very clear to Moses and all the prophets that his people would be blessed, be blessed immeasurably if they obeyed him, but would suffer harsh judgment if they rebelled. You could just read Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 is a very harsh chapter about all the terrible things that will happen to God's people if they rebel, if they disobey. And basically, it's what has taken place already here in Babylon years later. It lists blessings for obedience, but it lists harsh punishment for disobedience and rebellion. And the people in Babylon, they're there, they're suffering clearly because of the consequences of disobedience. And that's why they're captive in, in Babylon. And Daniel's letting God know he recognizes that, he accepts that. Verse 15, now, Lord, our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, who made for yourself a name that endures to this day, we have sinned, we have done wrong. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn to all those around us. Now, our God, hear the prayers and petitions of your servant, for your sake, Lord, look with favor on your desolate sanctuary. Give ear, our God, and hear. Open our eyes, your eyes, so that the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Lord, listen. Lord, forgive. Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. You see what he's doing? He's pleading to God for mercy. Now, God already said he'd bring them back after 70 years, but Daniel wanted to show God that he recognizes why they're in the predicament they're in, and, and he's pleading to God for mercy. He's coming with complete humility and contrition and repentance before the Lord, recognizing his, his sin, turning his, away from the sin, recognizing that what they did is absolutely wrong, and he's not trying to cover it up or justify it in any way. And this is very important to God. 
I want to tell you, God responds very favorably to to humility, but not so with pride and arrogance. And there's a huge difference between a repentant heart and an unrepentant heart before the Lord. A, A repentant heart or an unrepentant heart before the Lord. A repentant heart acknowledges his sin and recognizes it as sin, asks forgiveness of sin, just like Daniel is right here. An unrepentant heart hides, or worse yet, justifies one's sin. Now, two, two people may be caught up in the same acts and behaviors, and one is struggling because he has a repentant heart. He is sorry. He recognizes that what he's doing is wrong in the sight of God. He asks for forgiveness. He pleads for mercy. The other may be doing the exact same thing, but instead he either hides the sin or he justifies it or he convinces himself that it's not even a sin. And that is an unrepentant heart. An unrepentant heart tries to justify or hide. These two people may be of equal levels of conduct or behavior, but one comes to the Lord with humility and the other comes to the Lord in pride. And I use that word intentionally, pride and arrogance, and there's a huge difference before the Lord. You know, David was a a, a classic example of a terrible sinner, but he came with a heart of contrition to the Lord. Think about Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17. He's talking to the Lord. He said, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. God will never cast out or reject a contrite heart. And this is written by David after he committed a worse sin than probably any of us would ever even dream of coming close to. It was a combination of of murder and adultery of a close friend. And David did it. And God forgave David and restored him. Why? Because he came to the Lord in humility and contrition. Now, while Daniel's praying, something fascinating happened to him that has astounded Bible scholars to this day. For thousands of years, something took place. Here's what it was. Gabriel shows up and reveals a mystery about the numbers of years when important future events will roll out. And this is a very interesting section of scripture. Some people say probably the most powerful messianic prophecy about the coming of messiah and the end times in the entire old testament maybe even in the entire bible so let's get into it and i'll explain verse 20 while i was speaking and praying confessing my sin and the sin of my people israel and making requests to the lord my god for for his holy hill while i was still in prayer gabriel the man i had seen in the earlier vision came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice he instructed me and said to me Daniel, I have now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And here it is, verse 24. You're going to hear a phrase called 77s, and I'll explain it. Here we go. 77s are decreed for your Lord, for your people, and your holy city to finish transgression, put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. All right, 70 sevens are decreed. Now, we're going to get into what, what, the, what this means, and he, and he talks a little bit more and breaks it down later. But the 70 sevens is a theological mystery that has really garnered a lot of debate, great debate throughout uh, the ages. And when you think about the words that that are listed, it's 70, the number, and then this word sevens, which is actually shavuim in Hebrew. And and think about this. In English, we have a word for a seven-day period, right? A week. We also have a word for a 10-year period, a decade. But we don't really have a word for a 10-day period, And we definitely don't have a word for a seven-year period, but the Hebrews do. And it's it's the word shevuim. And depending on context, it could be for seven days, seven weeks, or seven years. It's similar to shavuot, which is seven weeks into Pentecost. But shevuim, seven weeks or seven years. It could be used either way. 
And so most scholars believe that this prophecy is saying there are seven Shevuim, sets of seven years, that this will take place. All right, so, and, and you'll see how it breaks down. It's going to be 70 altogether. That's what I meant, 70. First, it's one set of seven years. Okay, you got that. Then it's 62 sets of seven years. Okay, and then finally, one last seven-year period. And 7 plus 62 plus 1 equals 70, 70 sevens, 70 sets of 70, 7 years. I know it's confusing, but read, read verse 25 with me. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, which by the way means Mashiach or Messiah or Christ, but Mashiach in Hebrew, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After 62 sevens, the anointed one, that's that Messiah, Mashiach, will be put to death and will have nothing. Now this, I want to tell you something. If you, if you run those numbers, that 62 seven year period lines up exactly with the time of Jesus' death. I'll show that to you in a second. And then the people, this is afterwards, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, this happens after Jesus' death, and this lines up with the destruction of the second temple by Rome in 70 AD. Then it continues. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He, this is the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, one last seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. And that's how the chapter ends. Chapter nine ends that way. All right, I said I would explain it a little bit. I have a graphic. And the graphic will show you from 444 BC all the way till the end of time, the second coming of Christ at least. And, and there's three sets of times and they're not necessarily connected. And that's kind of why these uh, scholars put this this way. So it was, it was issued that from the issuing of a decree to rebuild Jerusalem starts at a certain point. And we know when that point is. It's the decree of Artaxerxes and we read this in Ezra 7 and Daniel 9. Um, and that's when it starts. And then you have the seven week period or the seven seven years it's 49 and then the 69 week period and it lines up to a.d 33 the exact year that jesus died exactly and then very shortly after that is the destruction of the temple which is described here in daniel 9. and then it's this thing we keep talking about where it seems like there's a a timeout of the succession of kings of the the the, the sec, uh, the you know the, the seven week seven year periods, and this we believe is the church age, and Jesus talks about it, and and the the gospels talk about this time period where people are given the opportunity to come in, as Paul says, the fullness of Gentiles, unbelievers will come in, and that period, we don't know the ending to, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. I keep saying that. We don't know the ending to it. It comes in Acts 1-7. But I just want to keep in mind that so the, he, in verse 27, is the Antichrist. He comes at the end. He'll have a seven-year period, and this is prophesied through the scriptures, that the first three-and-a-half-year period will bring peace to Israel, make peace with mankind, but then there will be the abomination of desolation in the temple, and the last three-and-a-half years is what we call the Great Tribulation, but it ends with Jesus returning in glory and then beginning his thousand year reign. Okay? That's what we believe is a very, our very popular eschatology. There's so many different versions of that and people that don't believe that as well, but this is what we believe. Now, when will all this take place? What's going on right now? What part of the time period are we in? Is it gonna to happen tomorrow? Is it gonna to happen next year? When is it going to happen? The thing is, we don't know. Only God himself knows. The apostles thought that would happen right at the end of Jesus, right before Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1. And then he, they asked him, is this the time that you're going to set up your kingdom? And he answered this in Acts 1-7. 
It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And this is a really good warning for all of us. We have to be very careful about being dogmatic about our eschatology, especially putting dates and times on what we believe the timetable in is it, it, specific dates. I want to tell you, many notable teachers have done this and made the mistake, uh, including the most famous is Harold Camping. He didn't start as, you know, as a uh, what would people come to believe is just an off base heretic. He started as a Bible teacher. And he, in his own mind, thought he knew the exact hours, the exact days, and he put several of them forth. None of them obviously came through. And he died, and his, his name is tarnished. His reputation is destroyed because he tried to do what Jesus said couldn't be done. It's not for you to know, Acts 1-7, the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. I want to tell you myself, I know this. I know the way I teach. I know the way I look at news. If I was living... It, during the World War II period, early part of that World War II period, I definitely would have been one of these Bible teachers that says, Hitler is definitely the Antichrist. We are definitely in the Great Tribulation. The atomic bomb will, is going to end it all. Um, Russia is Gog. Germany's Magog, or whatever it might be. And I would have been wrong. <laughs> so you've got to be very careful when you make definite statements regarding eschatology. Again, no one knows the time or the hour. However, we do know, we do know now that we are in the church age. And when you think about the time period that we're in, we are only nine years away from the 2,000 year mark of Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead. I mean, we are already in, if you take Jesus' lifespan and fast forward 2,000 years, that's exactly the lifespan you and I are living. It's very interesting when you think about it that. But the Lord is delaying his return until all who would believe are given a chance to, as the Bible says, come in. Come in. And it's like, a, it's, it's the period of grace. It's the age of grace. You know what a grace period is? Like if you have a mortgage, it's very likely that your mortgage company or your lender, your bank, has a grace period set up. You're supposed to get your mortgage payment in by a certain date. But if you don't, there may be, I'm not going to promise you, a grace period, seven days, maybe 10 days, by which you can get it in and they won't penalize you for being late. That's called a grace period. And we are in a grace period right now, the period of grace, where things could end at any moment, but God in his mercy wants to see many people come in to faith and believe. And I believe that this grace period will end, I don't know when, but it will end and that will mark the end of time. So what do we do? What do we do? I have three things as I close. Number one, ready yourself. Ready yourself. Make sure that you're truly a follower of Jesus. And you do that by putting your trust in him and truly believing in his word. Believe upon him and receive everlasting life and become a, a child of God, as John tells us. Ready yourself. Number two, be his witnesses. This is the last thing Jesus said before he ascended. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost part. Be his witnesses. Make sure that the people in your life have heard the gospel and perhaps even tell them the ramifications of rejecting Jesus and maybe even tell them what will happen if the rapture happens and you're gone and they're still here. In fact, there's some great articles online for people that have missed the rapture. I, mean, I, I love to see it. Be, that, you know, these pastors or these evangelists have written detailed instructions on what to do if you, miss the, if you miss the rapture. If all the Christians just happen to be gone one day, here's what you do. So, number two, be his witnesses. And number three, occupy until he comes. This is a King James phrase, occupy till he comes. That, that basically means do business until I come. And what does that mean? He means live your life. Do the things that you're called to do, that your chosen profession requires, but do it as unto the Lord. Luke 19, 11 through 13, Jesus spoke this parable. He spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. And therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas, and said to them, do business until I come. 
Now there's more to the, to the parable, and miners are a unit of m currency, money. But he basically said, here's what I want you to do. You're given this life, you're given this means, this resource, do business until I come back. And I think that's what God wants us to do. Live our lives, raise our families, pursue our calling, our profession, but always work towards the objectives of the kingdom of God. Because as we honor him in our daily lives, reflecting the love and glory of Jesus to all people that we know, many will come to faith. Many will come and be saved as we go about our days. Yes, preaching the gospel, being his witnesses, making disciples, many will believe upon Jesus and be saved. That's the reason we're in this grace period. And that means occupy until he comes. Do his business until he comes. Do what God has asked us to do. Be his witnesses, preach the gospel, and make disciples of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to close with this final ending. This is a benediction from Romans 16. And it's the prophetic writings that are being revealed and Gentiles or unbelievers are coming to faith. And so listen to this as we close. Romans 16, 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith. To the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.